to figure out why Paul says Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, sadly, my notes already included the information on that. So if you read the notes, you know. If you didn't read the notes, maybe you studied. If you didn't study, then guess what? You might not know. All right, but we are going to talk about that uh, today. But before we get there, we left out half a verse. We're in Hebrews 13, verse 7b. Verse 7b. Um, that's the second half of the verse. The first half, the writer says this. Remember them that have the rule over you. Okay, who are those individuals? Who are those who have the rule over you? over us. Yes, it's the elders of the church. Okay, the elders of the church. Remember them that have the rule over you. And folks, the only uh, human beings that have the rule over us as far as spiritually is concerned are the elders of a local congregation. Uh, where does their rule stop and start? Yes, in optional matters, okay, doctrines of faith, uh, I mean, and, and teachings of Scripture, they have no right to change those, manipulate those, withdraw those, add to those. The only thing they have the responsibility is making certain those are adhered to. But there are some things in local congregations that uh, are optional in nature, and we need somebody to make those particular decisions. And if we didn't have elders, then we would just have what? Yeah, we just have chaos, would we not? Because everybody would think that they have the responsibility and the right to make the decisions. So we'd have a bunch of bickering and fighting and arguing. Well, now we don't have that. An eldership goes into a room, they sit down, they talk, they come out as an eldership, and they announce the decision. And we, as members of the church, are to obey them. And we're going to talk more about that as we go through Hebrews, the 13th chapter. Um, now remember he says, remember them. Does anybody remember what that involves? Remember them. Nobody. I didn't teach it very well, I don't guess. Folks, it involves, you know, bring to mind, but it means more than just bring to mind, you know. Don't just get up and think, okay, we got a couple of elders down there at Oceanside named Larry and Bill. That's not what he's talking about. It, it means to wake up and to, yes, remember them, bring them to mind, but also to put yourself in their place and feel for those individuals. Folks, the task that an eldership has is a daunting task. It is not easy. And um, we'll talk uh, more about that uh, in another passage as well. But notice he also says this to us, and now we're getting into the new part of the lesson. Uh, you know, not only call them to mind, but also copy their faith. Whose faith what? Follow. Folks, the Bible in three places, really four if you take the Old Testament text, but in the New Testament there's three times this phrase is used. The just shall live by faith. What do we mean when we say we are to live by faith? What's that mean? Live by faith. Okay, trusting in God, is that all what living in faith is? You know, we have a lot of denominational people who uh, wake up every day and they think they're living in faith because they're what? Trusting in God, is that living by faith? Are they living by faith? No, so that tells me that just trusting in God uh, maybe isn't enough when you say live by faith. What, are we, what does it mean? Okay. Ah, now see. Uh, that's when he, notice what he says. He didn't say whose life follow. Is that what he said? Whose life follow? What does he say? Whose faith follow? You see, every day, elders ought to be getting up 
And every day, they ought to be wanting to live a godly Christian life. Let me ask you something. Are elders of the church a unique... Well, let me change that. Are elders of the church supposed to be a unique brand of men? Yes. I have listed down there some things about these individuals. Number one, they're older. How do I know that? They're older. Oh, look at them. <laughs> That's what you, you said. <laughs> but, but how do I know all elders are supposed to be older? Yeah, the word means elders, okay? Uh, the translation of that word, the meaning of that word is older man, okay? Not novices, not new in the faith, older men. Notice secondly, they are knowledgeable, right? They're supposed to be knowledgeable, apt to teach, able to convict the gainsayers or a couple of their qualifications. These men have spent time and diligence in the Word of the living God. So they're knowledgeable individuals. Thirdly, they are experienced individuals. How do we know they're experienced? Okay, they've been faithful Christians. The Bible also says that they're the husband of one wife, that they have faithful children, right? Not accused of riot or unruly. So guess what? They have fought the battles of family, haven't they? They've reared their families. They, they've gone through all those trials, all those tribulations, all those difficulties uh, of raising children. So they're experienced. Uh, uh, they, most of them have been out in the world. They've, they've been working. They've been teaching. And so they're, they're very experienced individuals as well. Fourthly, they've raised their families. Fifthly, they are what? Mature individuals. Not babes, but they're mature. And they have met all of the qualifications for the office found in 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. All the qualifications of an elder. Not just part of them, all of them. And there's quite a few of them, aren't there? Okay, And so uh, this is a unique brand of man. And so every day this man gets up and he lives his life. He lives his faith. Folks, if you're a faithful Christian, you live your faith. Okay, It's not enough to have just a mental belief in something Okay, when it comes to the faith. You have to have that. But then you have to make certain you are living that in your life. And so if I'm living my faith, I can tell somebody to follow my what? Follow my faith. Whose faith follow? Wow. Is that a pretty big obligation laid on the backs of elders? Every member of this congregation ought to be able to put Bill right here and follow him just like this. Step by step by step by step in everything he does today and ultimately it ought to take you where? It ought to take you through the gates of heaven. Wow. Big responsibility. Same is true of Larry. Okay, guys, you know, these positions are very, very serious positions. Okay, they're, they're, not, they're not, you know, just a position of power and a position of authority over the congregation, something that brings me prestige. It, it, it's serious business. I've I got a whole church to look after, and I've got a whole church who is following after me. It's pretty big, isn't it? Whose faith follow. Now watch what he says in the next statement. Yeah, I think there are, um, you know, I think once you reach a certain plateau, okay, uh, like an elder, uh, there, there's times when an elder's work is different than a deacon's work. And, you know, an, an, an elder can't be an elder, deacon, preacher, teacher in every congregation, okay? He can't, that, that, that's why God gives us what? Elders, deacons, preachers, teachers, 
right, and members. And so um, there's sometimes when elders, their position is such that guess what? They need to be doing something else rather than maybe doing the physical components of the congregation. Okay. Now, if need be, should they be ready, willing, and eager to do it? If it needs to be done, has to be done, sure. And the members know that. In fact, they've seen these men do that in times past, haven't they? They've seen them on their knees working. They've seen them uh, uh, out visiting. They've seen them doing whatever needs to be done. And, but that doesn't mean that now that I'm an elder, I have to do everything. Because guess what? You can't do it all the time. It's an impossibility. Okay, and there's some elders who kill themselves trying, you know, and it, it, it just can't hardly be done. And so that's why there's a designation of duties. But I, they, they do have to be men whose faith can be followed. Okay, uh, men who you look up to, men who are respected. Notice some of the lessons there. We've already looked at the first one. Notice that uh, the writer of Hebrews says, Consider these men. Guys, that word considers pretty strong. To look at, that is attentively. Thayer says, to look attentively, to consider well, to what? To observe accurately. Man. Elders can't say, or shouldn't say, do what I say, not what I do. Okay? Okay? They shouldn't be able to say that. We ought to be able to look at every component of these men's lives, and guess what? It is in harmony with truth. Okay? And that's a pretty, uh, that's a pretty big uh, uh, responsibility to, to feel. Notice point B there, it is sad when members do not believe that their elders are men who are worthy to be followed. Okay? Uh, I know of a couple of congregations wherein uh, the elders of that congregation, uh, they are not where they need to be. And their members know those elders are not where they need to be, and yet they still call themselves what? Elders. That's a scary thought. Because one day, these men will give an account to the chief shepherd, won't they? Uh, and uh, so that's kind of a scary uh, situation to be in. Notice this. It's sadder when elders fail to set to see that they are not living their lives in such a way as to be an example for the flock. That's even sadder. It's sad when a congregation looks at an elder and says, you know, I really can't follow that man. It's even sadder that that man doesn't recognize that. And somehow he's hidden his eyes to the fact that I'm not living the way I need to live before this congregation of God's people. So, uh, very, very uh, important responsibility. Members of the local church should be able to pattern their lives after the lives of the elder. And guess what? Make it to heaven, folks. Now, here's something that's interesting. This next statement, he says, Considering the end of their faith. Now, what do I always tell you to do? I always tell you that definitions are important. Okay? Okay? When you hear that phrase, considering the end of their faith, what do you think of? The end of their faith. What, what comes to your mind just by reading the statement? Huh? Death. Death. Anybody else? Uh, no, I see you've already looked it up. Uh, that ain't right. Yeah, yeah. I got what so-and-so says right here. You know, no. <laughs> what does he say? Uh, the outcome of their conduct. Huh. Now see, that to me is where even the New King James translators didn't do a very good job translating the word end of their faith. Okay? When you look up the definition of the word end, it says this. To go out. A what? Exit. An exit. An egress. Way out. Exit. The end of one's life refers not only to the end of physical life, but in the manner in which they closed a well-spent life as established by their spirit in dying. He's pointing these individuals not just to elders who are living, but also to rulers who have what? Died. I want you to look back and I want you to remember those men who did what had the rule over you considering the end of their faith. 
They're exiting of this life. Had there been some individuals who had been killed for the cause of Christ? Oh, yes. We have a man by the name of Stephen who had been, don't we, in Acts chapter 7. And so there were some men, elders, who had exited this life and he says, I want you to consider not just the fact that they died for the cause of Christ, but I want you to consider the fact of how they handled dying for the cause of Christ. Okay? They didn't groan. They didn't moan. They didn't deny the faith. They didn't weep and cry. They boldly stood there and guess what? They exited this life as faith children of the living God. And I want you to look at how they died. Consider the end of their faith. How they exited this life. Is that pretty important? Folks, it's very important when you're living in a time when you're being persecuted and that persecution could be ramped up to the point where you are required to give what? Your life. Now, it hasn't reached that point yet as far as these particular Christians are concerned. They have not yet resisted unto blood. But guess what? That time could come pretty easily, could it not? It doesn't take much. You know, if you're already in lock, locked up in jail, it doesn't take much for a leader to say what? Ah, just kill him. Right? Had they done that to John the Apostle? Yes. And guess who was sitting in prison awaiting his death? The next day, Peter, was he not? In Acts chapter 12. And so, um, you know, it's very easy for that to transpire. So I need somebody I can look at and see how they did it so that what? So that I can do it if that time ever comes. And it's wonderful to have leaders uh, that we can uh, look at and uh, see that that's the case. Wow. Um, let's go to the next point. All right? Jesus Christ. Okay, here we are. You just talked about rulers, right? Remember them that had the rule over you? And all of a sudden, out of the blue, comes this statement. Right? Jesus Christ. The same yesterday and today, and forever. Now guys, here's something we need to understand. There are no verses put in the Bible just simply to be put there. <laughs> Does that make sense? When a verse is put there, it means something. The writer wrote that because he had something on his mind. He wasn't just trying to communicate to us that Jesus is the same all the time. Even though he does, there's more to it than that. But it seems a little odd. It seems a little out of place, doesn't it? What in the world? You just stick this in here. Well, let's look at it for just a minute. Notice that first one. This is an interesting verse. It seems to appear out of nowhere. It just seems to be an expression of truth, doesn't it? Right in the midst of all these commands that He's given. He just tells us Jesus is the same. Well, what does He really mean by that, folks? Let it first be remembered that some of these individuals were moving away from who? Jesus. Guys, listen to me. You move away from the faith. You move away from Jesus. You move away from the church. You move away from Jesus, right? You move away from the Bible. You move away from Jesus. All of these things are connected one with another. You move away from one, you move away from all of them. So here these individuals are, and they are being tempted to what? Go back to Judaism. Leave Christianity. Here's what he's saying. If you leave Christianity, you're leaving who? Jesus. And what I want you to remember is this. Jesus is what? The same. You hear what he said? Yesterday. When did they obey the gospel? Yesterday. Didn't they? What it means is what? In the past. 
yesterday. That's what, yesterday is the past, right? So here these individuals are. They were taught about Jesus, right? He's the Son of God. He's the Savior of mankind. He's our intercessor. He is one that's paved the way for us to go to heaven. He is our sacrifice. He is the Messiah, the King that we've been waiting for. He is God in the flesh. And now He is in heaven, appearing on the right hand of God for us. And they believed every bit of that. And that is what caused them to obey the gospel, wasn't it? Well, guess what? That one who was that way yesterday is the same today, isn't he? Folks, Jesus hasn't changed. If you loved him, adored him, embraced him, if you had faith in him, way back there when you obeyed the gospel yesterday, then guess what? He's the same Jesus when... Today, even though you're going through what? Trials, tribulations, persecution, mocking. Maybe you're being taken out of your wills from your family. Maybe you're being put in prison. You're being ostracized. Maybe you're being fired from your jobs. Yes, you're going through all this bad stuff, but you need to stop and you need to remember something. Jesus is what? Still the same today. Folks, he's the same in character and he's the same with regard to his faithfulness to his promises. That's not changing. If an individual departs from the faith, is it because Jesus changed? No. It's because what? I changed. Right? That's why, because Jesus is the same all the time. Folks, this is a statement that is designed to encourage their faith, right? But, 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 but Paul, or whoever the writer is, right? We don't know how long these tribulations are going to last. This could go on for years and years and years. That's right. And guess what? Jesus will be the same for ever wanting. And you see, one of these days, one of two things is going to happen. Persecution will end or I will die. And folks, I'll either die with Jesus or I'll die without Jesus. That's the only two options. Isn't that true? It's the only two options. And he's trying to encourage them. Guys, don't Leave Jesus. You accepted Him. You became followers of Him for a certain reason. Hold on to that. Even though it's hard, even though it's tough, don't ever let Jesus go because He'll always be the same. It's a beautiful text. Barnes makes a beautiful statement there. from his commentary. We won't go and read that whole thing, but you go home tonight and you just focus on that statement, folks. Okay? Here's something he makes mention of. Don't be fickle in your faith. Okay? Do we have people that are like that? A little fickle in their faith? Yeah. People that are so fickle in their faith that even a little weather can keep them from being faithful. Right? A little weather. Oh, it's going to rain. I better not get out tonight. Change of, uh, of, of time of the year. Oh, it's winter. Getting a little dark. Can't go. Dark. Can't go. I understand. You can't drive. Guys, there's 50 people here. Call somebody. I can't drive. Come get me. He won't come get you. Call an elder and say, he won't come get me. Elder, need to go talk to that man. He does. You won't go get your brother and bring him to the services? I understand you can't drive in the dark. I understand it's dangerous, but what? That's no excuse not to come to service. Oh, I just can't drive. Guys, we can't be fickle in our faith. Jesus doesn't change. Neither can what? Neither can we. Wow.
Oh. Oh. Um, well, he's going to get to that, uh, but right now he's just talking about what? Just your faithfulness, period. Okay? Oh, yeah, he's going to be the same all the time. Yeah, that, that's the point that he makes uh, in, in uh, the entirety uh, of this uh, section. All right? So he just brings Jesus Christ in order to encourage them what? Keep your faith in who? Keep your faith in Jesus. He'll always be the same. Beverly? And she's new. You know, she's new. She's not mature yet in the faith. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, well, every, every person is different. <laughs> uh, they'll, they'll make a lot of uh, uh, promises to you, won't they? Okay. But there's a difference between a person who's been in the faith for a long time and is because of persecutions and trials and tribulations is not faithful. And a new Christian who's coming out of a lot of error, uh, coming out of a life that has never been faithful and needing to sit down and talk to that person and mature that individual. Okay, um, And yet there's a lot of Christians who haven't matured themselves, right? And they're still babes in Christ just as much as they were. 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago. And uh, folks, we got to develop ourselves and mature ourselves in the faith. Um, but just remember, come what may, you can change, but guess who will never? Jesus will never change. Wow. All right, now we get down to another point. False doctrine. False doctrine. Look what he says. First he gives them some direction. Be not carried away by... Divers and strange doctrines. Okay? Be not carried away. That little word's a pretty interesting word. Uh, it originally meant when a person gets sick and he couldn't move himself, what did people do? They carried him. Okay? Remember the palsy man that they went and they broke up the roof of the house and let the man down? How'd they get him there? They had to carry him. He was born, the Bible says, by four men. Okay? Well, that's the picture that Paul is using here. Be not carried away. Don't get on the what? Don't get on that bed of false doctrine and be toted away. Let me ask you something. When others are carrying you, can they carry you about anywhere they want you to go? Yeah, they can carry where you want to go. You know, you can be screaming all you want to. Don't go there. Hey, I mean, I'm, I'm the one toting you, dude. You just sit there and hush, right? And that's what happens a lot of times. People jump on a bandwagon of false doctrine, and guess what? That bandwagon takes them in places that sometimes they never dreamed they would go. Thayer gives an interesting definition. To carry around. Notice what else he, what else he says. In what? Doubt and hesitation to be led where? Now. now to that opinion. Now to that opinion. You see, when a person is not fully convinced of truth, guess what happens? He can believe this opinion, and then another comes along and he believes that opinion. And another comes along and he believes that opinion. Guys, let me tell you something. There are people out here in the world who have been baptized four, five, six, seven times. Did you know that? Why so many? Why so many? How many of you have been baptized seven times? If you have, I'm just going to call you Naaman. Okay? Ain't no, no, not one person in here raised their hand and said, I've been baptized seven times. 
How many of you been here baptized one time? Ah, looky here. One time. Okay. But why are people baptized four, five, six times? Because they're carried away by divers and false teachings. Now this is one reason that I tell young people when they come to me, Mr. Vic, Mr. Vic, Mr. Vic, I want to be baptized. Well, I'm not just going to baptize you. I'm going to sit down and what? I'm going to study with you. And I'm going to talk to you. Okay? And it's for two reasons. Number one, when you do this, I want you to know you know what you're doing. Okay? And number two, I don't want you to get down here 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years down the road and say, you know, I don't think I really knew what I was doing. And I need to be baptized a terrible again. You can't be baptized again. Okay? Not scripturally baptized again. You're only baptized what? Once there's one baptism. The Bible says Ephesians 4 verse 5. You're only correctly baptized one time. Okay? And, um, you know, I don't want a person getting down there. I want them 50 years from now looking back and go, I, man, I know, I know what I was doing. Because Vic sat me down in that room and he taught me what I was supposed to do. That's what I want them to say. You see, and I don't want them to be carried about by false doctrines. Okay? Now notice he describes these doctrines in two ways. Number one, what? Divers doctrines. What's that word mean? Different. I love Strong's first word, motley. Motley doctrines. Various in character. You ever seen a group of boys and you look over there and you say, Ooh, that's a motley crew. Why do you say that? Yeah, they're just all crazy, aren't they? Go back in your room. <laughs> Ain't seen him all night. Man, he's not even a deacon. And if you want to, you can just put an E on it and make it diverse. You satisfied? Ah, yes. It just means various. Folks, what he's really talking about is not, not, just, not just the fact that there's a lot of them, okay? But there's a lot of them that are what? A lot of different uh, ideas and a lot of different uh, things that make them up. And uh, they can all be talking about end times, can't they? You know? And then when you start getting down into all the fabric of what they believe, you're going, oh, man. You know, you would think they all believe the same thing about premillennialism or whatever, and guess what? They don't. It's just, man, it's just all kinds of stuff, right? How? There you go. You know, 19, 20, 22 year olds being elders. Yeah, crazy stuff. Notice the next one strange. Divers and what? Strange doctrines, foreign, alien, new, unheard of. Are there new doctrines being contrived all the time? Yeah. Oh, yes, all the time. Beverly? Oh, yeah. Well, what they do, and this is what all these evangelical churches have done, is they've taken a market approach to evangelism, okay? And uh, when you take a market approach to the church, rather than a truth approach to the church, well, then you're satisfying the needs of the market, okay? Isn't that what a market... A marketing does, you know, uh, you satisfy the needs of the market. Well, we're not trying to satisfy the needs of the market, okay? We're trying to do what? Save the souls of men and women. And sometimes men and women don't want that, do they? 
Okay, and so a uh, big difference. Notice some lessons there, folks, and this is interesting. There is one truth, but there are what? Many false doctrines, strange doctrines. Blah, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits where they have God because many false prophets are gone out into the world. We've been studying on Thursday night class, uh, the first Monday night of each month. I think we're almost into a three years of study, okay? And um, we've studied about five different religions, okay? And we've been really studying the, a lot of their doctrines. And, um, you know, that we, we've just touched the hem of the garment, folks. We, we haven't even begun to talk about the error that is in the world today, okay? Just one truth, but what? Many false doctrines. And it's almost so many that it's, uh, um, you know, overwhelming, okay? Because there's so much, especially now that we're more of a world society, okay? You don't have to know just about the Baptists and the Methodists and the uh, Presbyterians who are around you, right? Now you walk up to somebody and say, Hey, uh, tell me a little bit about what you believe as far as your religion is going. Well, I'm Baha. You're who? Baha. Ain't never heard of that. Well, yep, that's what I is. So now what you got to do? You got to go study Baha, and you ain't never heard of Baha. Where are you going to get information on Baha? Thank the Lord we have what? Google! You know? But it's crazy. Note this. In the context, the author has in mind the doctrines and teachings of the Jews that were leading the Christians astray from Christianity. Okay? So, um, you know, they, they, they were taking their religion and they were really trying to stress it to these individuals that, that what we have is what? The truth. Um, what was one of the big arguments of the Jews? Does anybody know one of, the, one of the huge arguments of the Jews? Yes, circumcision was big, wasn't it? This is the sign that God gave Abraham, that you are in a covenant relationship with God. And that led to the second point. We are the children of Abraham. Okay? I find it interesting that Jesus, when he was teaching, he says, Think not within yourselves that you are the children of Abraham. God is able to these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. See, I'm a child of Abraham. So I'm what? So I'm saved. You know? Just think about how the Jew would put a pressure on a Jew who's converted to Christianity, right? You're leaving being a child of who? Of Abraham. No, 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 no. Somebody turn over Galatians for a minute. Somebody turn over to Galatians. This is free right here. Somebody read verses 26 through the end of the chapter. Galatians 3, 26 through the end of the chapter. Ah, don't you love it? And if you be Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Don't tell me I'm not a child of Abraham. I am a child of Abraham. Right? That's exactly what Paul just said. If you be Christ, right? We are the children of Abraham, folks. So, uh, you know, these Jews had it wrong, and you hope that when they come to those Jews with that concept, that guess what? Oh, no. You just think you're the children of Abraham now. We're the children of Abraham. Well, what about circumcision? What about circumcision? Doesn't matter anymore. Doesn't matter anymore. Whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised, it doesn't matter anymore. Right? What matters is what? The circumcision of the heart through repentance and immersion into Christ for the remission of sins. That's what matters now. Okay? 
And if you've done that, then you're Christ, and then you are what? Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Man. Point number three there. Folks, only truth what? Makes man free. Only truth makes man free. John 8, 32. Strange doctrines, various doctrines, guess what they do? Yeah, they lead away from God. They lead away from truth. They lead away from Jesus Christ. Notice point four. We can take steps to protect ourselves from strange doctrines, can't we? Or can't we? Can't protect yourself from strange doctrines? Ah, folks, the best way to protect yourself from strange doctrines is to study your Bible and learn the truth. Okay? That's, that's the best way to protect yourself from strange doctrines. And here's what's wonderful about knowing the truth. I only have to know one argument that they can't answer to refute their doctrine. That's all I have to have, one argument to refute their doctrine. I, I don't have to know the whole doctrine. Okay? Because to do that, You'd almost have to be God nowadays, wouldn't you? To know every religion, every doctrine, and, and every facet of that doctrine. All I have to know is what? One argument that will break their doctrine. That's all I have to know. And so it's not as difficult sometimes as it seems. Notice the last point there. False teachers have been tolerated, ignored, and in some instances embraced by unfaithful elders, preachers, and members. Notice that next statement. Far too little has been done in answer to false teachers presently assailing the walls of Zion. Wow. Pretty powerful statement. Brother Waycaster made that in his commentary. Um, all right, guys. We're going <clears> to <throat> we're gonna get in this next point. It, it doesn't matter that we didn't get there. This next point, even though it, it, it's in the context of these false doctrines, it will lead us right into the next section. We're going to try to get in about five verses next week, okay? Because all those five verses are talking about the exact same thing. So uh, we'll get in there and talk about that uh, next week.